So I, I can go next. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Vimla Martinez, and uh, I would love to learn more about the Psalms. I read it. Uh, it gives me a lot of comfort. I, um, I enjoy reading the Psalms, but I'd, I'd like to do a study on, on them. Beautiful. Nice to meet you, Vimla. We're glad you're, glad you're here. Yeah. Enjoy the class. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to, yeah. So I have a quick question. Is it okay if my mom joins? I was just texting. Absolutely. Absolutely. I sent her the link. Thank you. That's terrific. Yes. So everyone is welcome. And, you know, we're going to, um, you're welcome to come to some of the classes, to all of them, if you'd like. Um, each week will be a little bit different. Um, they will build on each other and can also, uh, designing the course in a way that hopefully each um, session can also uh function on its own, right? And you can, can jump into the learning. Um, so um, I'm just gonna open us up with a little bit of song um, and, and then we will jump, um, jump into our learning. Um, I just wanna see if anyone else wants to check in, introduce yourselves, Alicia. <laughs> Oh, there, unmute. There you go. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Yeah, yeah. You can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it's nice to see everybody. Um, I did see the class. Um, I'm interested in Psalms. And also, Rabbi Annie, I realized since you've been here, I haven't taken a session with you. So I wanted to learn with you as well. Um, and uh, upcoming in the fall, when I return to JTS, they're going to be, I'm going to be studying Brachot. So I thought, you know, that's more tactical. That's the, you know, that's the liturgy, but I, I think Psalms are more enriching and they're kind of like the other side of prayer. So I thought, you know, learning with you would kind of give me a balance of, of both. So I'm looking forward to it. Terrific. Glad you're here and hope you'll bring some of your insights also from your studies at JTS. Um, great. And we'll just give, if anyone else would like to check in, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself, introduce yourself. Or Diane, yeah. I was just thinking, you know, I've been reading the Psalms really most of my adult life, as we all have probably, but when it, when it became very significant to me was actually uh, the day that my stepson got married, and he, he's part of the Chabad um, movement, and his wife's, like, his, you know, fiance's job that day was to read the entire Psalms. Mm -hmm. on the day of her wedding. That was the assignment to the woman. And I had never really thought about how that can be such a spiritual grounding for the woman in a relate or anybody in a relationship, but that that was her assignment for that day. And it was a really profound experience for me to, to just observe her because she really did not want to engage outside of really holding that energy. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And we are going to talk about some other ways that the Psalms are used ritually and used in life cycle moments and woven into our liturgy. But thank you for sharing that. That's powerful. Um, well, say mm -hmm. hi. Hi. I'm, hi, I'm Sheila Siegel. And um, um, I love Psalms. Um, they, you know, it's like the Psalms are, it's like the book of the human heart, you know, from the you know heights of joy to the depths. Um, it's like there's a Psalm that expresses whatever we happen to be going through. Um, so it's a great opportunity. There's you know always more to more to see and, and more to, to learn about what they offer. Beautiful. Um, and in each of our sessions as well, there is going to be time where we go into Hebruta into small groups for study in, in breakout rooms. So hopefully folks will have a chance um, in those spaces as well, to share a little more with each other about your stories and how you're experiencing the texts that we are, are reading. So I want to lead us in with a song, um, which is one of my favorite verses that appears in Psalms, in Psalm 118, um, and is also part of 
the, the Torah and the book of Exodus, um, a verse in the Song of the Sea that we're told that our, our ancestors sang when they had made it out of the narrow place of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, had made it to the other shore. Um, and according to some commentaries, um, they actually sang the song, not when they had made it to victory, but sang along the way while they were crossing through the sea with the walls of water on the left and on the right in this moment of great uncertainty, calling out these words, Oziva Zimratia Vaihili Lishua. My strength and the song of God will be my salvation. Um, so feel free to join along at home as well. If, if you know this tune, the tune comes from Shefa Gold. Oh, Ziva Zimratia and the song of God will be my Yeshua, my salvation. And so the book of Psalms is a book of poetry and it's a book of song. It's a book of songs. Um, and one of the questions we're going to be exploring in our time together is how might these songs give us strength? Um, how might we tap into this liturgy of our tradition um, the part of our tradition that I like to think of as our, our medicine chest to help us make it through challenging moments and narrow passages to help us find words to celebrate our greatest joys and offer gratitude when we can't find the words. Um, we have this, this framework of Sefer Tehillim, this book of, of praises, this book of songs. Um, uh, I first encountered Sefer Tehillim, the book of Psalms, sort of as a whole, uh, in Jerusalem when I was living there after college. I remember riding on the bus and seeing uh, women um, often with a book, you know, a small a Sefer of Psalms of Tehillim open, like sitting there and davening as the bus uh, was winding its way through, through um, Jerusalem. And as the bus would get crowded and everyone was smushing together, right? Just sitting there and davening and going through, through the words. So I connected it, you know, started to learn about it. There was some practice of reading these um, Psalms, reading these poems um, that um, for, and not only for women, but at the time, that's how, you know, how I first encountered it. Um, last year, um, my nephew went through a very serious uh, health challenge and thank God he's, he's healed, he's doing well. He's um, 14 years old and while he was um, 
struggling while he was in the hospital. And my, my sister-in-law, who's part of the Orthodox community in Passaic, New Jersey, told me she had was part of these WhatsApp groups that were um, completing the book of Tehillim every day. And that hundreds and hundreds of people had joined WhatsApp groups to recite Tehillim, in particular for the healing of Shimon and the healing of so many other people. So I said, how do these work, right? So there are 150 um, Tehillim. And so instead of when someone will find a spare moment, instead of maybe going on the phone and scrolling through Facebook, they'll pop open even on the phone um, Tehillim, the book of Psalms and and look at the WhatsApp group and say, okay, so somebody just did Psalm 55, we're up to 56. I'm gonna do 56, okay, type it in, 56, I completed 56. Next, someone else picks up you know, the phone and says, I have some time, I wanna recite some Tehillim. Oh, we're on you know, 58. And multiple times a day, the, the Sefer would be finished with all of these people together taking on this collective project of um, using this liturgy, using this poetry, using these songs um, to lift up prayers for healing. Um, and throughout the tradition, um, the, the Psalms to Hillam have been associated with calling out in times of distress, um, you know, moments of sadness, frustration, hopelessness. Um, there are Psalms that are also connected, you know, uh, for folks who want to find a, a shidduch, there are certain psalms that have been, you know, through through the years assigned to that. Find find love or partnership, or on a wedding day, or um, if someone's praying for a healthy birth, um, or for recovery from illness, for parnasa, for for livelihood, for peace, um, for the Jewish people, for Thanksgiving, for divine guidance. So people have put together all kinds of guides to the Psalms as well, as to which ones they encapsulate, as Sheila, you said so beautifully, the whole human heart, um, which ones may be used um, in these moments of seeking some particular um, way forward or, or blessing um, in life or, or offering Thanksgiving. Um, I wanted to speak um, a little bit about the history and the composition of the, the Book of Psalms, um, what we know about it. And then in our time together today, we're gonna do a deep dive into Psalm 1, the very first uh, of the Tehillim and Sefer Tehillim. We're gonna break up into small groups um, to study this Psalm in a few different English translations, um, because I know, you know, for, for many of us, Hebrew is not our first language. And um, I think working with different English translations can be really rich for illuminating the meaning and the poetry um, in the text. Translation itself is an art form. And so the translators, you know, had to put in a lot of um, thought and research and study into capturing the emotional valence of the Psalms. And um, from those groups, we're gonna take an opportunity to also reflect personally uh, what the psalm means for us, what resonates for us, what we wrestle with in the text of that particular psalm. And at the end of our time together this evening, we're going to hear a, a new and creative interpretation of, of this first psalm, of a verse from the psalm um, that I found very moving and hope um, I'm excited to share with you. So that's our, our plan for today. So now we're going to come into sort of the, the lecture part <laughs> of our time together um, about Sefer Tehillim. So, you know, in our liturgy, um, our daily liturgy, our weekly liturgy on holidays at life cycle moments, uh, so much of it is woven from the book of Psalms. Um, also, you know, other moments where folks draw on Psalms for ritual. Um, when someone has died, the, the Hever Kedisha um, and the Shomrim, those who are tasked with the, the holy work of, of accompanying someone um, preparing them for burial, they read Psalms um, in that moment, right? We call on Psalms in times of mourning. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, expressions of, of gratitude and also times of, of distress and danger. Um, we find echoes of the Psalms in a lot of literature and poetry. Um, many Western writers, including right, Yehuda Halevi or um, Emily Dickinson, Augustine, a lot of them have um, inner lives that are touched by some of the, this liturgy and poetry of the Psalms. So we find their echoes um, in, a, in a lot of literature. Um, two scholars I wanna lift up tonight um, whose words and um, uh, understanding of, of Sefer Tehillim I wanna share with you, um, Rabbi Richard Levy of, of Blessed Memory 
um, who uh, taught at Hebrew Union College recently published a new translation and commentary on the Psalms, um, which really gorgeous translations called Songs Ascending. So if you're also interested in, in purchasing a book, it's available on Kindle or on, um, you know, as an ebook or as a, as a physical book. Um, it has within it all of Sefer Tehillim in Hebrew and in English um, with really beautiful new translation and commentary. And so we're going to be looking at some of his translations tonight. We're also going to be looking at um, Robert Alter, who's a, a biblical um, scholar, literature, a biblical literature. Um, so the Psalms uh, talk about, um, according to Richard Levy, these three major moments in the narrative of the, the Jewish people and of, of the world, um, of these moments when God intervened in history, right? The story of creation, um, the story of redemption. So we began with a song from the Song of the Sea, from that moment of deliverance, um, and also the moment of revelation of God through Torah. So as we go through Sefer Tehillim, we find echoes of these three major events in the narrative of our people and the ongoing unfolding of God's presence in history. So one of the things that Sefer Tehillim asks is how do we respond to the majesty of creation, um, the miracle of redemption, the responsibilities of revelation of Torah, right? Um, and everything in between. Um, what happened before all those things or um, uh, how do we respond and deal with the chaos, um, the despair, the anxiety, the hopelessness, um, when we're not able to connect to God making order of the world to helping us have a, a moment of rebirth and coming out of, um, out of Egypt or, or finding revelation. Uh, so we offer these songs as, as a tool for reaching within ourselves and beyond ourselves and for making meaning of our lives and of events in our lives. Um, Richard Levy writes, through Psalms, the Jewish people's uh, collectively remembered experience of redemption and the ordering of chaos through creation and revelation become the heritage of each of us, ready for us to uh, proclaim when the world around us turns stormy. That is why we should not speak of reading Psalms, he says, but of offering them, of reaching into the treasure house of our common legacy and bringing out one or more of these shining verses, holding it lovingly up to the light and singing the song as though we ourselves wrote it long ago, um, which I thought is just a beautiful way of, of putting it, right? He talks about offering psalms, reaching into the treasure house of our common legacy and bringing out one or more of these shining verses, holding it lovingly up to the light and singing the song as though we ourselves wrote it long ago. Um, so finding our own voice in it. Um, so the psalms are meant to be musical and we know this because a number of them have sort of head notes that infer this. They'll say for the conductor or on a 10 stringed instrument or on a giti, which is some kind of instrument. Um, and also a lot of them contain words related to ways of expressing um, praise or gratitude or relationship through music. So sheer is a word for song and for poetry. Tehila, the book of Tehillim is a word for praise, but it's tied to musical praise. And mizmor is another word for making music, which appear all throughout the Psalms. Uh, we don't know the original settings or the melodies. Uh, for many years, musicians um, and contemporary musicians as well have been proposing their own settings for the Psalms, but we um, have reason to believe they were used musically and sung, right, um, in some way um, in uh, when they were first introduced. Um, they also poetically are full of um, interesting literary devices where we can find in the Hebrew and in good translations, they take note of this and try to, to capture the alliteration of the language, a little bit of rhyming, um, but sometimes there are some debates uh, about whether it actually rhymes or just has to do with the Hebrew grammar, you know, endings that have some rhymes in it, um, but there's a musicality to the, to the language. There's also uh, something that we see in a lot of the Psalms of parallelism, which is a repetition of ideas within the verses. So, um, you know, you'll have a verse and the first half of the verse expresses an idea. The second half of the verse will express the same idea in different words, or maybe it will kind of play with a contrary idea, or it will focus in on the idea or deepen in on it. And Robert Alter says that this gives the psalm some of their emotional intensity um, because the, the lines have this strong forward thrust and ideas are pushed to the extremes and themes are brought to a crisis and a turning point. Um, there are many images in the psalms that are grounded in 
the agricultural world, which perhaps resonated for um, those who, the poets uh, who wrote the Psalms and their audiences and, and those who, who offered them. Um, so, uh, one of the things I just want to lift up about translation, which I love. So Richard Levy translates, we have a song, or uh, Psalm 96, we say, Shir Ladonai Shir Chadash. And Shir Chadash, it's often translated as sing to God a new song, Shir Chadash. Shir a song, Chadash new. Um, but so in his translation, he thinks about this concept. Like, is there really a concept of newness in, uh, in our tradition, he says, if we look in the book of Ecclesiastes and in the, in the wisdom literature, um, we read there's nothing at all new under the sun, right? He says, so if there's no such thing as new and only things that are renewed, he translates this verse as sing as though song itself were new, um, which I thought was just gorgeous. Sing as though song itself were new. And I think that's one of the things that we're invited to do through, through these songs, um, to find ways that they can renew us, that in singing them, we also renew um, these old treasures of our, of our tradition. Um, so a little bit of historical context. Um, the Psalms were rooted in or came out of the near, ancient Near Eastern world, um, according to Robert Alter and other scholars, that they date back to the late Bronze Age, or that world, right, where that they would have emerged from. Um, which was like 1600 to 1200 BCE, um, because in those societies, um, in Egypt, Mesopotamia, um, Syro Canaanite literature, we find uh, similar hymns um, that were celebrations of the gods at the time that were, were common. Um, and there's some mythology and imagery and verbal formulas in our Sefer Tehillim that's shared with these predecessors, um, though theologically, right, our, ours are. A you know, monotheistic worldview. Um, so it builds on this previous mythology and imagery and also innovates. Um, but we have God, you know, different images of God. The Psalms are filled with interesting theological pictures of the world. So we may see God as a compassionate healer, a sustainer of those who are brokenhearted and, and low down and most vulnerable. And God is also a warrior and full of fire and full of rage. Um, so we, we have um, An echo. Some of those are echoes from images of God or the gods in the ancient Near East. Um, so a big, big question about Sefer Tehillim is who wrote it? Who wrote the Psalms? Um, some of them are attributed to King David. Uh, David was known for playing the lyre and King Saul hired him to help ease his mind through music. And David, we're told, you know, we read stories that David would compose music while tending to sheep. Um, However, you know, uh, there's no credible historical grounding that, that David actually wrote the songs, um, but scholars think that it was a regular practice in the later biblical period to ascribe new texts to famous figures of the past. And some of the Psalms are also attributed to the children of Korach, to the children of Asaph or Mos Moses or Solomon or others. Um, but the scholarship says they're probably you know, the, the actual poets are anonymous, um, but, but there is something powerful, right, about these words being ascribed to these leaders and things we can learn, learn from that. Um, so, um, and again, the precise dating of the Psalms is not clear, um, but scholars think that um, some appeared in sort of the first Commonwealth period, 996 to 586 BCE, and others in the period of the return to Zion, right? And 586 was the destruction of the temple. Um, and so, you know, some of that echoes in the text where the, the pain of the exile. Um, but overall, we, we think that the Psalms were produced by many different poets over more than 500 years or more than half a millennium, um, and maybe even dating, uh, beginning during or before the 10th century BCE. Um, some psalms were designed as liturgy and for use with uh, ritual acts, such as offering a Thanksgiving sacrifice. So we assume they were used in the temple practice for different rituals. Um, and this, I, I really loved the story. I don't know, has anyone been out in um, Rittenhouse Park, uh, Rittenhouse Square, where you see there's a poet named Marshall. You can hire a poet and kind of go up to him and he'll say, can I write you a poem today? I guess if you want to show me a show of hands, if you've ever encountered him for our, our Philly local friends walking around Rittenhouse Square. Fun evening. 
Yes, yes. Yes, you've seen Marshall, right. So you can go and say, he'll say, what do you want to write a poem about? I've been there with my daughter and she says unicorns, right? And he like sits there with a typewriter <laughs> and he comes up with a poem about unicorns and um, oh, he's a yeah. poet for hire in the park, right? Um, what's that? Is it, I heard somebody responding. An opportunity to give someone money. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so apparently there's, a, uh, people think that worshipers coming to Jerusalem um, possibly purchased psalms. There was a professional poet, right, a psalm poet who would sit in the vicinity, you know, of the temple there in Jerusalem, and people could say, I have this need, I have this thing I'm praying for, and the person would write <laughs> the psalm. So maybe some of our Tehillim come, you know, out of a very real personal experience, either for the poet or for someone uh, for whom they were writing that, that poem. Um, so there are, um, different genres of psalms from among the, the 150 that are identified. So some, uh, and the lists vary, uh, but some of the psalms that are, some of the categories used for the book of Tehillim, supplication, a calling out to God, thanksgiving. So like those are the two kind of major genres, the wisdom psalms, which speak about um, kind of finding meaning in the world in a system of virtue and psalm number one which we're going to look at i think would be classified as a wisdom psalm so tonight we'll we'll get into one of those um psalms of enthronement of god royal psalms historical psalms zion psalms um psalms of praise so those are, are some of the category robert alter says that there is a lot of genre fluidity right and hybridity of the psalms um he says the main ones would probably be like thanksgiving and praise and supplication but some within one poem are gonna change voices and take you on a journey um into the depths and and out again right into the narrowest place and um towards freedom um so overall what we what we know about the psalms and from how they they began was that it was a, a multifaceted poetic form that served many purposes, some as part of the ritual life of the people, um, and it played a, a vital role in the life of the Israelite community and of individuals within the community throughout the biblical period. Um, the anthology that later became Sefer Tehillim, the Book of Psalms, was put together in the Second Temple period probably around the fifth century BCE. So one of the things that's interesting is we also think that at that time is when the Torah was first redacted as a, as a book for public reading. Um, and the Psalms are divided into five books, perhaps to parallel the Torah, right? So they're to kind of chunked into five um, sections, like we have five books of the, of the Torah. And people assume, you know, we don't know who the editors were, but probably priestly circles in Jerusalem. Um, the word psalms uh, is of Greek origin, and that word was introduced by um, Christianity. Um, and for that reason, Rabbi Richard Levy likes to talk about the authors of psalms um, as a poet rather than a psalmist. Um, just like works, works for him, but I'll probably be alternating, referring sometimes the psalmist, the poet, the psalms, the poems, to heal him, these uh, songs of praise. Um, and... Uh, Robert Alter writes, um, he says, again and again, the psalmists tell us that man's ultimate calling is to use the resources of human language to celebrate God's greatness and to express gratitude for God's beneficent acts. This theme is sometimes um, given special urgency by being joined with an emphasis on the ephemerality of human life. Only the living can praise God. Um, so I think the psalms really touch on the preciousness um, of life. Uh, and, and that's a, a theme we will see coming up again and again and, and in our time together tonight and moving forward in the sessions. Um, you know, I, I want us to be considering these questions of how each of us gives expression to our inner life and our, um, how we might wanna use the liturgy of the Psalms in our prayer life and how the, the Psalms might inspire us in a new way to, to give voice to our prayers or to be, to be a tool for us personally. Uh, Rebbe Nachman of Breslov um, encouraged, you know, had a practice of reciting Talim and encouraged this for others. And he said, a person should endeavor to find himself within all the Psalms and within all the supplications, entreaties, penitential prayers and the like, and easily, simply without any sophistication, he can find himself within all the supplications and entreaties, and especially in the Psalms, 
which were composed on behalf of the Jewish people for each and every one personally. Um, and he told um, a person whom he spoke about reciting the Psalms that the main thing is to say all of them referring to oneself and finding oneself in each and every chapter. Um, Rabbi Dov Singer, um, who wrote, I, I really recommend, this is a marvelous book called Prepare My Prayer, Recipes to Awaken the Soul, um, a contemporary book. It just came out a few years ago. And he says, um, he, he refers to the Psalms, right, as poems. A poem touches the reader's heart when it transcends the poet's own experience, releasing the experience of one to the great wind that carries the poem beyond. King David, the poet of the Psalms, bound to his royalty, the divine spirit beating within him, playing his harp. His words have been whispered ever since, through the generations, tears absorbed in a book, lips moving. To read the book of Psalms and to feel the divine inspiration from which the words were carved, to see the face looking out at me from within the verses, to sense the life force of the words and through them, my own vitality. So um, there's some, some invitations as we're, we're going to jump into um, in um, the, this very first psalm of the book of Psalms, which is in this category of wisdom psalm, and uh, which affirms in some way a traditional moral calculus of the universe, right? That it pays to be good and that the wicked will be paid back for their evil. Um, this is something that also in some of the wisdom literature, right, like the book of Job objects to this. Like, is this actually the, the order of the universe? Um, but I'm going to invite you, we're going to, in just a few minutes, um, break out into small groups to, to do a deeper dive into the first psalm. Um, I'm going to pull up something on my screen first, a source sheet. I'm also going to share it in the chat box. Um, let's see with everybody. Um, let's see if that works. I don't know if that, whoops, hang on one second. Um, you know, I'm going to share my screen for now and then when we're going into breakouts, I'll make sure I can get it to everybody. Okay. Uh, okay, so thumbs up. Can folks see the, the psalm on the screen? Okay, so this is Psalm 1. So I'm going to read it in Hebrew. I'm going to read one translation and then send you off into groups to read it through um, the other translations. All right. Ashrei ha'ish asher lo halach ba'atsat reshaim uvderech hataim lo amad uvmoshav letzim lo yashav. Ki im betorat Adonai chefzo, uvtorato yege yomam valaila. Vehaya ke eitz shatul al palge maim, asher pirio, yitain be ito, ve alehu lo yibol, vehol asher ya ase yatliach. Lo chen her shaim, ki im kamots asher ti defenu ruach. Al ken lo yakumu reshaim ba mishpat ve chataim, ba adat sadikim. Ki yodea Adonai derech tzadikim, v'derech reshaim toved. Happy is the man who has not followed the counsel of the wicked, or taken the path of sinners, or joined the company of the insolent. Rather, the teaching of the Lord is his delight, and he studies that teaching day and night. He's like a tree planted beside streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose foliage never fades, and whatever it produces thrives. Not so the wicked, rather they are like chaff that wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not survive judgment, nor will sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord cherishes the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Okay, so this is the first Psalm, and I have a few other translations. Um, so I'm going to send everybody, uh, let's see, for, for 10 minutes into our breakout rooms of groups of three or four. Um, and in these rooms, so I have on this source sheet, three other English translations of Psalm 1. I don't know that you'll get to all of them, and that's okay. 
One is from Richard Levy. One is from Robert Alter. And a third one comes from Norman Fisher, who was a Zen priest who created a whole book of Zen-inspired translations of the Psalms. So he really plays around with, with the God language and it takes it in a whole different direction. But I want you to read these different translations with your Chavruta group and think about which translation is most compelling for you um, and, and why. Um, think about what imagery the psalmist or poet draws on. Um, what are the emotional experiences, if you can find them, you know, identify between and beneath the lines. And again, this is, falls into that wisdom uh, literature category, right? It's not necessarily a supplication or a Thanksgiving praise, but I think beneath the, the expression of this worldview, like what's kind of going on in the inner life maybe of the, of the poet or the one for whom this poem is written, um, what resonates with you in the psalm and what are you wrestling with in the text? Um, so those are a series of questions in 10, 10 minutes, uh, maybe, let's see, we'll do, maybe we'll do 12 because uh, we'll, we'll communicate in the, in the breakout rooms. Um, so David is going to send us into breakout rooms um, and I'm going to put into the chat box the, the source sheet um, so it should pop up for you in your, in your groups. Um, all right, I'm going to stop the screen share for now as we go into our breakout groups. Um, great. And you'll be invited, prompted to join the breakout group, so if you can do that. Um, all right, I'm going to get this file. Uh-oh. Oops, hi, David. I'm just having trouble. I don't know if that worked, the thing I sent, but let me... Okay. So um, if, you wanna, if you wanna send it to me in chat, I can send a broadcast message to everyone. Okay, so let me, can, I need a, can I make it public on Google Docs? I don't know why it's not restricted. Only people added, hold on, the share with. Why is it not letting me share it more widely? Uh, copy link. It says yeah. only people added can get the link. Um, okay, so um, let me see if I can grab it and download it and then share it. Okay. And um, I'll share it with you. Know sure. yeah. here. Okay, sorry, it didn't quite work. Access denied. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 And um, it looks like I need to assign Rosalie to uh, going to assign her to break our room. Or, or maybe she didn't click join. Let's see. Okay. Um, and is there any way that I can't see the breakout rooms or join them? Okay. Yeah, actually, let me make you a host and then you can see all of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then can I at least share, do a screen share in the meantime? Um, so click click on um, click on your rooms, and then you can do a broadcast to um, all of the rooms. Where do I broadcast a message to all? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, but it's not. Okay, no, I've oh. got it now, so I can download it and share it if you like. Oh, that would be so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it says source sheet number one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So right now, am I screen sharing with everybody in their breakout rooms too? Uh, no, they can't see your screen okay. share. Okay. And then, um, No, but I don't know if we can chat with them. Hmm. Yeah, no, you actually have to visit the rooms. 
Oh, okay. Um, so you could just uh, hover over a room and join that room and then join other rooms. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to, um, I'm now going to share this. So you can broadcast it to everybody? That we're um, yes, I'm going to grab back the um, um, host for just a second. Yep. Now I'm going to broadcast. Ah, I can't send a file. Okay. I don't know why the Google Doc, I can't give access. It's something with the BZBI. All right, maybe I should. No, no, it's okay. I got it. Hang on. Um, oh, boy. It's not. Um, it's not working. Okay, I can bring people back or. I don't know why I can't make the link public. It's. Uh, All right, I should have worked this out before. Um, okay, one more try. If I um, copy the Google Doc. Yeah, no, it's not accepting it. No. I downloaded it and I don't know why I can't get it from my computer. Okay, if I send you this link from a PDF on my, well, now I don't have the chat box either. So yeah, right. no, you're going to have to back and, um, okay. I'm going to give you back, um, hosting. Okay. And, um, if you want to make me a co-host now, I can jump from room to room if you want me to, otherwise I'll just stay here. Oh, if I make you a co-host. Okay. So what can I do? Should I bring people back? I if, you might want to visit a room for a couple of minutes. If they can't see the sources, I don't know what they're talking about. Maybe they found it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I mean, I'm happy to. Let me just, all right. I'll just join a breakout room. Yeah. And then you can come back and um, bring everyone back if you like. Uh, Rosalie, can you... Um, can you hear me? Do you want to join one of the rooms? difficulties getting the source sheet. So we're going to um, read uh, through just all together. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for uh, going for the ride. I hope you got to meet some new people. I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties. So I'm going to read through the translations. I'll put them up on the screen share um, now. And um, you can email out uh, the, um, the, the file and, and figure this out better for next time. Um, but I, because I, I would love for you just to hear these different translations of Psalm 1 um, in, the, in the time that we have left. So. Um, can you all see the, the screen share the questions on the page? So can I get a thumbs up? Okay, so I'm gonna read these other translations because I think they're really interesting and we'll have a little bit of time to discuss. Um, 
I hope you made some new friends in your breakout rooms. Okay, <laughs> in the meantime. Uh, so this is Robert Alter's translation. Psalm number one. Happy the man who has not walked in the wicked's counsel, nor in the way of offenders has stood, nor in the session of scoffers has sat. But the Lord's teaching is his desire, and his teaching he murmurs day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in all that he does, he prospers. Not so the wicked, but like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand up in judgment, nor offenders in the band of the righteous. For the Lord embraces the way of the righteous, and the way of the wicked is lost. We'll just give that a second, a second with this translation from Robert Alter. You can kind of see what, if there are any images that jump out, what you like about this translation, what resonates with you, what doesn't. And Richard Levy's translation. Happy is the human who has not walked in the counsel of the wicked and in the path of sinners has not stood, and in a chamber of cheats has not sat down. Finding delight instead in the Torah of Adonai, reflecting on that Torah in the daytime and the dark. Like such a human is a tree planted by a stream of water, offering its fruit when the time is ripe, leafy at all times, never withering. Whatever it produces lasts. Not like this are the wicked, they are like chaff instead, scattered by the wind. Therefore, the wicked cannot withstand judgment, nor can sinners stand in a community of the just. So we're just going to work, work with these two translations for a second, so the Richard Levy and the, and the Robert Alter, but what is the um, sort of the main thrust of this psalm? What... Um, what in it resonates for you? What are you wrestling with in, in reading it? Please a hand if you want to speak. Unmute. I, I found the first one to be uh, at the beginning. The person had a choice. He could go with the wicked or not. And mm -hmm. then once he made that choice, then it told you what happens if you made that choice. The second one seemed to be that he's already made the choice and he's very happy that he did. And then it tells you what would have happened if you had not made that choice. And the third one is much more pastoral. Uh, mm -hmm. It describes all kinds of uh, leafy things and uh, that, uh, that if you make the choice, how wonderful it is that you're in this garden or whatever. So um, that, that, that's how I see the differences of the three. Mm hmm. Nice. And so, right, it lifts up this like you this aspect of choice, right? There are different paths that we can choose, and there are consequences of being on those paths. And according to the worldview, right, of this poem, there are just consequences that if we do good and act righteously, um, there will be a reward, and those who don't um, will be punished. Yeah. What what image is used to represent a life of righteousness um, and a life of um, Wickedness. Alicia, yeah. A tree. A tree. Yeah. Um, I get the tree and the, and the nature part for sure, but in the tree, it, it's you're nurtured and you're nourished deeply and you're producing something and uh, uh, presumably good fruit. But for the, the shaft, I'm not a farmer, but that's like when they separate the wheat from the shaft and then somebody eats it or it's thrown away or it's disposed of and it kind of dries up. So it's almost like it's there for a moment, it's there for a season, it dries up and dies and kind of blows away. So you can see if you're making a choice, would you rather be a, a, a good fruit that continues season after season or do you want to be part of the garbage that kind of gets blown away? So some mm -hmm. of that imagery uh, I thought. Yeah. Beautiful, right? And using those agricultural images, which would have resonated at the time, like a tree really rooted and nurtured by the soil and nourishing, like um, 
in the Torah, right, representing the, the water of Torah, um, giving life to the tree, which gives life through the fruit, versus this chaff of living a life without that grounding that just um, doesn't have um, continuity or, or impact or depth. Yeah. Yeah. Use of Adonai instead of the Lord. Uh -huh. in, the trans in terms of the different translations. Yeah. That feels right. Keeping that Hebrew, keeping that Adonai um, does something. Uh huh. Yeah. Other thoughts about Sheila? Oh, you're muted. Hold on one second. It's of human instead of man. Yeah. Uh huh. Which right. is very lovely. I think the, what troubles me is the second to the last line therefore the wicked cannot withstand judgment. That's. Um, that 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 concept of judgment is introduced there, and mm -hmm. it, it doesn't appear before. It seems more like this is the natural path of of the wicked person, and this is and this is the natural path of the righteous person. And here, judgment becomes a factor. Mm -hmm. Whereas it seemed that the the image was, you know, the chap that couldn't just couldn't endure the wind was just so weak. Uh -huh. endured due, due to its own nature. <laughs> uh -huh. But you're saying the judgment part feels troubling of like that there's some external. It just sort of just felt like a different, it just has a different feel about it than the, the, the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, yeah, sorry, I left off the last line of the translation, but before, for Adonai penetrates the path of the just, but the path of the wicked will disappear. Um, Right, so it's interesting. Is it about the person? Is it about their path? Is it about the mark that they make on the world and sort of appealing to, like, what does it mean to live a life of Torah? Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I find it, you know, an inspiring vision that, um, an aspiration that if, if we are going to live a life of righteousness, a life of Torah, a, a life of meaning, um, that will will make an imprint will make an Im impact um and on the other hand it's you know in the way that job wrestles with it doesn't always work out that way right when we look around mm -hmm. at the world um you know for many years i i struggled with some of our liturgy in the seed or much of it coming from psalms that spoke so much about uh, prayers you know about the the wicked and may the righteous flourish and the way you know just with that language and lately it, i don't know i find it resonating more just like seeing um within the world, you know, these destructive forces. Um, we talk about, you know, there's, there's a story in the, in the Talmud um, where um, Rabbi Meir is, um, there's a group of people in the neighborhood who with a lot of disregard for others. And, and he, you know, says, I w want these sinners to cease from the earth and his very wise wife, mm -hmm. Maria said, no, we shouldn't pray for the sinners to, to be struck from the earth, but rather for, for sin, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, some of this resonates when it becomes not about the people, but about the path, you know, the, the um, this sense of the path of justice or, um, and the path of, of the wickedness. But um, yeah, what does it mean in our prayer lives to really um, cling to this sense that there is a deeper meaning in the world, that a path of Torah can lead us to righteousness and that we can, um, on that path, whether everything is just or not or works out in the ways we want, um, just to, to have faith that in, in some larger scheme that we're... Um, as far as translation goes, you know, Alter I know was what I've read about Alter is he wants it read out loud, even if it's in your head. Uh -huh. And the, the legal uh -huh. translation kind of stops me, you know, human instead of saying man. I know it's, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it's sort of an awkward word. And then Adonai penetrates the path of the just. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Hebrew is ki odea Adonai, that God yeah. knows and penetrates is is not a word that it, it sort of it stops me cool. it, it looks it looks awkward to me uh-huh yeah no thank you for sharing that right so it doesn't it doesn't feel 
right, it feels a little awkward or stumbling on the words, whereas this other one, um, the Robert yeah. Alter, and right, that word Yodea um, knows, also has like an, in, or no, so he says, for the Lord embraces the way of the righteous. Um, yeah. He had a commentary in his translation. He chose that because even the biblical to know someone biblically can also like have kind of uh -huh. intimacy. So he chose this word. Um, <laughs> yeah, we know that God. one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The biblical sense, God right, <laughs> knows the way of righteous, but like really like, you know, desires and yearns for it. Um, uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to stop the, the screen share, um, yeah, for just a moment, but um, yeah, so we just wanted us to have an opportunity to dive into at least, um, you know, one of, one of the Psalms today. Um, I know we're, we're running um, out of time, but I, I want to also offer if folks, um, I understand if it's eight o'clock, if you need to go, you're welcome to. For folks who want to stick around for five more minutes, I would love to share with you uh, one other interpretation of this psalm, which is a, a musical piece, um, that a contemporary piece written by Rabbi Shir Yaakov Feit, um, where he, he started a practice during the pandemic of um, every day uh, offering some music um, inspired new music, a new song, um, a renewed song, right? Um, a song as if it were new based on the book of Tehillim and he's going in order of, of the different Psalms. So he sent this one, um, he posted this one for the first Psalm. So I'm just gonna click on a, on a link um, and hope for the best here. Okay. <laughs> I will share it if I can share my screen again. Shavuot uh, Tov, this is Shir Yaakov. So I was home today, um, like can folks most hear everyone I know. Shir Yaakov? Yeah. It's okay. Shabbat, and um, right before Shabbat, I learned about the governor of New York's um, I want to stay at home ahead, for the next 90 okay. days. Mm. And, um, as that I just want to play this song for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I <laughs> Ah, uh, ya. 
just wanted to offer that um, creative interpretation of this uh, first psalm by Shir Yaakov, who is a poet who took poetic license with the translation and what the words of this psalm might mean um, and wanted to leave us with a few questions for reflection inspired by the psalm as we move forward into the week. Um, that image of being rooted like a tree, right? What helps you to feel rooted in this world and in these times of, of chaos and transformation, what helps you to feel rooted? What is it that gives your life meaning? And Richard Levy, in response to this psalm, he says, how can we strengthen ourselves to stay on a path that will let us sink deep roots into the virtuous life? Um, so that's my, my wish for, for all of you this week, is um, that you will find the support you need to feel rooted in these times on a path of righteousness and and really held um, by by those around you, um, helping you to you do not not to walk on that path alone. To know that you're rooted um, not only in the Torah but in a, a community of practitioners seeking out that meaning and seeking out um, that goodness. Um, so, wishing everyone blessings this week. Thank you for for taking a, a deep dive into Psalm 1 and into some of the background history um, about the book of Tehillim, Sefer Tehillim. Over the next three weeks, um, we're going to be looking at um, some Psalms of Thanksgiving one week, some Psalms of Supplication, and one of the weeks we're going to focus on um, the 23rd Psalm, mm -hmm. um, which is one of my favorites. So those are our, our lineup uh, for the coming weeks, um, and I will work out the tech uh, before next time. Um, but thank you all so much for, for being here and learning together. Uh, feel free to be in touch if you have questions or reflections that you want to share that came up for you um, tonight. I'm going to encourage you to turn to the book of Tehillim, um, you know, in, in your own time as well and see see what you find when you open up the book and see how it speaks to you. Our gratitude, Annie. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rena and Stanley. So nice to see everyone and be with everyone. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Bye, everyone. Bye, Take care. Take care. Bye, Alana. Bye. Bye. Take good care. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for helping with all. Um, David. David, also, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll see you all at uh, in about 20 minutes. At oh, back for Minion. Minion. Right, if folks want to dive in some of the... Yeah. All right, take care, everybody. Okay. Always well. So much. Be well. I love you.